Welcome, everyone. Um, let me uh, welcome you all to the um, spring uh, 2016 CNI membership meeting and what looks like a really nice day in San Antonio, um, which we arranged special for you all. Uh, I am delighted you're all here. Um, I hope that your travels have been uh, relatively painless. Um, I'd like to make a special welcome to a couple of folks. Um, we have with us the um, new cadre of uh, Clear Fellows at this meeting. And um, could you all just kind of wave your hands in the air? Uh, yes, we have quite a group of them over there in the back. Anyway, um, uh, you'll have an opportunity, I'm sure, to meet them at uh, sessions and at the reception tonight. And we're delighted that they're here with us. I'd also like to extend a particular welcome to our foreign visitors. Um, Getting here from abroad can be quite an adventure, and uh, we are very, very pleased that you're here with us. I'd like to welcome four new members who have joined us uh, mid-program year, and I think um, at least three of them are actually physically with us at this meeting. Those four new members are Skidmore College, the Crest Foundation, Index Data, and Swarthmore College. Welcome, new members. Um, changes in the program happen, and I want to direct your attention to the um, message board out by the registration desk. Thus far, while we have had a couple of um, changes of speaker, which I won't go through um, with you, the only actual ses session change that I'm aware of is that um, in the uh, 515 slot today, we've had to cancel the breakout on the open uh, library of the humanities. Uh, Martin Eve, unfortunately, is um, uh, not well and can't be with us, but we're hoping we can reschedule that soon for a future meeting. Uh, I just, you know, sort of urge you to um, keep an eye on that, uh, that board for changes as we go along. Now, um, with those uh, bits of um, news out of the way, I'll just note that there are instructions for how to get on the Wi-Fi in your registration packet. Um, if you have trouble with that, just let one of us know and we'll try and figure out what's going on. Uh, there um, also are some announcements of upcoming meetings and I may, I'll, I'll say a word or two more about those um, when we gather tomorrow afternoon for the um, closing session. So with that stuff out of the way, I get to do something really good. I get to introduce Victoria Stodden. Um, I am so pleased to have her here doing the opening plenary today. Um, we go back a while now. Um, I think we probably first met at AAAS a few years back, but I wouldn't absolutely swear to that. I think we've been um, at a number of the same events dealing with various aspects of cyber in infrastructure, the future of scholarly communication, and things like that. <clears throat> Victoria has been a pioneer in really trying to think through issues about the replicability of scholarship in the digital age, um, which is a tremendously important topic. Um, it really not only is an important topic to the quality of scholarship itself, but uh, also, I think, to the public support of, um, of and um, the public honoring of scholarly work. Um, the public sinks a lot of money into underwriting research of various kinds, and I think um, replicability of research results and understanding what that means 
is an integral part to having confidence in the record and the outcomes of research and to earning and maintaining public support for the research enterprise. So the stakes here are very high. Um, Victoria, I think, brings a really powerful set of insights into how the great shift towards computational technologies and data intensive technologies and network te technologies are really changing the, um, the, the entire nature of the scholarly enterprise. And um, she's going to share some of that thinking with us and um, uh, also help us to think about the implications of this for the communication and the documentation of scholarly work and for the scholarly record itself going forward into the digital age. So please join me in welcoming Victoria Stodden. So it's such a pleasure to be here, and I was so delighted to get the invitation to come and speak and, and address you all. And I feel like this is a perfect audience for the types of things that I love to talk about. So um, one of the th I've done a couple of things to help facilitate our discussion. So my slides are on my website if you prefer to follow along on your iPad or click on some of the links in the slides. And I'm going to try very hard to leave time at the end for um, many questions. And I'll be around actually for the entire meeting. So also, if you don't get a chance to ask your question, please feel free to just grab me or, or talk to me. Um, defining the scholarly record for computational research, as Clifford uh, very generously mentioned, I have spent um, uh, the last few years of my career trying to think about what does it mean to do research when you have a computer involved in the research that is something that I'm loosely calling sort of high integrity research. So one of the, um, uh, one of the things I'm going to try to do in my talk this afternoon is really build up what that means or how we might conceptualize something like that when we're using computers to derive our results, um, building all sorts of software around these uh, scientific findings, working with massive data sets that are complicated and coming at us at high velocity. And what does that mean for things like transparency in the research process? Second, second order verification of the results, if you're a, a reader or a user of these, these outputs of research, and how do we start thinking about this? Because it's all really kind of very new about how we share or disseminate research. Okay, so I was gonna touch on three aspects uh, in my talk today. Uh, the first two I'm gonna go through fairly quickly, but they set the stage for the rest of the talk. So the first one is really trying to pull apart and understand what are these technological changes that are impacting say, for example, our conception of what the scholarly record could be. If we can tease those apart, we can start to understand how they're interacting with the research and the reuse, and how we can actually start to think about what each of these changes might actually demand from us. Then I wanted to touch on well, if we're thinking about what we should be doing, in some sense I've introduced a normative dimension to our discussion. So in research, we have long-standing norms. So I wanted to talk a little bit about those norms and whether we can lean on them for strength, thinking about where we should be going with all these changes. Then the bulk of my talk will actually be the impact on the scholarly record, and what I'll do is take these different threads in this framework that we've been building up and to see if we can start to understand different ways that we might be reconceptualizing or thinking through what the scholarly record might look like in this age of digital, deeply computational, high impact, high, uh, high velocity data uh, research. Okay, conceptualizing the technological change. So um, I think there's, there are several ways to break down how, how technology is really causing these up, really sort of turning um, how, we do, how we do research on its head. So the first one I think everybody knows, we've got enormous amounts of data. It's not just more data of the same where we need to scale the same that we've always been doing. It's 
totally different types of data. So we're doing all sorts of different types of research. We have a very high dimensional data, which is new, and uh, streaming data, and these very different types of data. And it, so it's not really just a question of size, it's all a question of character of these different types of data sets. Um, the second one, probably people in the room have thought about this one deeply as well. Um, we also have much faster computers. So what this has done, separate to the increase in, in, in the size and availability of data, the very fast computers have allowed us to do different types of scientific research. So for example, we're asking questions of, say, a physical system, where what we want to do is take that computer simulate the physical system, change the parameters, rerun it, change the parameters again, rerun it, and ask questions about our world using that computational technology. It may or may not have data involved. And then the third um, aspect that I think is causing very deep changes in the research and in the dissemination that I hear almost nobody talking about is the role of software. So my background is as a statistician, and if you think about the methods that are applied to these data when you're doing the research, all sorts of um, munging of the data sets, preparation of the data sets, you need to understand where there are outliers, what's good data, bad data, to even get it ready for the analysis. Then when you apply the analysis and the models and do the actual research and the inference, all of this is being done in software. And it's not in the publication. So then the question becomes, well, we're actually making these contributions to research, to discovery, and how we actually, have, how we do inference in this digital research world that are appearing only in the software. So how do we actually have that as part of transparency or reproducibility, and how do we communicate that aspect to others in the research community? It used to be that we could actually include this in the methods section. Now, the scale of the work that's actually happening on the computational side and the, the production of, son, of software around um, particular scientific results, it's, it's not possible to include a complete description in the methods section. So I have a little photo here. This is a screen grab of uh, Lior Pachter, who is a um, professor of mathematics and biology at Berkeley. And he's giving a keynote in 2013. And in the course of the keynote, he happens to mention that the software that's being generated, say, in biological research, he goes, the software contains ideas that enable biology. So we all have an understanding that the scholarly record, of course, contains ideas that enable biology or whatever your field of interest is. Um, however, now it's actually appearing in the software as well. So what do we do about that? OK, another couple of comments about technology. So of course, um, everybody's aware of the changes in communication due to the um, internet due to network technology, and um, it's not just a question of digitization, but also of access. And I won't go into the myriad examples that are, that are well known. Um, the last thing that I'll mention about changes in technology is the role of intellectual property law. And this is something where traditionally in research we haven't thought that much about it. Um, even when I, I first became a grad student, you could still find some professors who would you know, write a letter to other professors asking for a preprint, and the preprints would get mailed around. I'm sure people remember those days. And, um, and we didn't think much about what that meant in terms of intellectual property. Now, making things available on the web, intellectual property is everywhere. So one of the things that travels with this discussion is a subtext all the way through on all these components is, well, what intellectual property rights adhere? How can I actually make that work accessible, reusable, something people can use, say, to reproduce the work and extend it? And those are big barriers. So I'll get to that at the, at the end of the talk a little bit more. OK, now grounding these changes in scientific norms. So hopefully uh, you feel very motivated there that there are lots of deep changes happening in the way that research is carried out and then the, the opportunities that we have for disse dissemination of that research. But if we think about um, what researchers are trying to do, what mindset they have, what the end goal actually is, then we end up in this discussion of, of norms. So one of the things that I like to do in um, framing a discussion around reproducibility is 
spin the concept into three rough groups. There's overlap and so on in all of them. But I feel like parsing out these different aspects of reproducibility um, is very helpful for framing the discussion. So one of the things that, that um, when people talk about reproducibility in, in research, they mean empirical reproducibility. So the way I think about this is the type of reproducibility we've had since the 1660s when we started to communicate results and findings with this notion that you should be able to read the paper and independently, you don't have to contact the original researchers, independently reproduce and verify those results. So empirical reproducibility would be things like um, at the bench in a biology lab, actually doing things in physical space. And so this, that's our traditional notion, and there are many interesting questions around that notion, and, and, and it has actually garnered a lot of attention in the last couple of years. However, nothing's actually changed with that discussion. Those, all those technological affordances that I just mentioned, they're not impacting empirical reproducibility. They're things like, can I get the reagents that you used in your experiment? Can I access your stem lines? And so on. Okay, so contrast this with um, the notion of statistical reproducibility. So doing inference, have I done things like design the experiment in such a way that I would expect the experiment to give the same results in a, in, when it's replicated in a different setting, for example. And so I won't go much into statistical reproducibility here, mostly in the interests of time, but there are many mistakes and um, errors that can be made just in the statistical aspects of the research that would cause the research not to replicate. So if you have your ducks in a row, uh, statistically then I think you could satisfy statistical reproducibility. What I will be spending time on today is this idea of computational reproducibility. So there the idea would be, can I regenerate your results? Say, for example, if you have digital raw data, you have, as I mentioned, you may have done some pre-processing, you may have some analysis steps in software that you've applied to the data, and then you've published some findings. So the question would be, well, can I actually replicate the computational aspects of your work? Can I get the figures that are in your paper, or the tables, or the output? Um, so probably most of you are thinking right now, well, okay, so maybe if I can regenerate results using the same software, the same data, I haven't really you know, said anything about the correctness of those results. Are they scientifically valid? Maybe I can get the same wrong tables and the same wrong figures in your paper. And that's all true. However, if, uh, the way that I think about it is that's, in a sense, a baseline level of what we should be shooting for in computational reproducibility. At least I can get through and check that the machine ran the stuff the right way on your data and got the um, results in the publication. After that, I can do things like independently try to re-implement your methods and then see if I can get some similar results. If I can't rerun your, your code on your data and actually regenerate your findings, how am I going to understand why our results differ if I do an independent replication? And they will definitely differ. So we, in a sense, we need both types of research, but I do need that deep level of transparency in being able to inspect all those computational steps that you went through to get to your final published results. And of course, right now, there are, there are researchers that are taking this on and, and making it a priority in their work, but generally speaking, you just can't do that from that traditional publication. Because the tradi traditional publication was, of course, defined for empirical reproducibility. So the question in my talk, well, what do we need for computational reproducibility? What does that publication look like? OK, so empirical reproducibility, I won't go too much into this. I feel like I explained it pretty well. But a couple of examples here about how labs, biology labs, tried to reconcile results around um, empirical reproducibility. And the, the, the point here is it's not easy either. So it's not a question of any of it being easy or difficult. The computational aspects are really the, the new aspects that I've been focusing on. OK, so statistical and computational. OK, so I wanted to peel back the covers on computational and reproducibility a little bit. So we're leaning on um, a development of norms around computational and reproducibility to try and understand what, we, what would be appropriate in this context. And traditionally, we've thought of 
scientific research as having two branches of the scientific method. So we've thought about the deductive branch of scientific reasoning encompassing formal logic or mathematics, all this type of deductive reasoning. And then we also have the inductive branch of the scientific method. So for example, statistical analysis of controlled experiments, you're certainly not applying deductive logic in that context. There's an enormous amount of chatter around how, how technology, as I've described it at the beginning of the talk, is creating new branches of the scientific method. So you've probably all heard this, the third branch of the scientific method around simulation and around intensive computation, fourth branch of the scientific method around uh, data-driven discovery and big data. I put a provocative question mark there on branch three and branch four. And so my argument that I'm submitting to you is that computation presents only a potential third or fourth branch of the scientific method. So why do we even have a scientific method? Can't we just, you know, we kind of have an idea of what science is or what research is and what we need to do. Why do we really need a formalized method around this? And the presupposition that led us to the idea of um, a scientific method is that everything we're doing in research and in discovery, we're in new worlds, we're trying to generate new information that explains more about our world, it's fraught with error. I mean, we're just people trying to make sense of things. We're going to make mistakes all the time. We do make mistakes all the time. We never get to a notion of certainty in, um, in research. We just kind of feel like we have a better grasp on things or things are more likely to be right or we have not a particularly good grasp on things. And we're always trying to move to that, to that feeling of greater certainty around our understanding of the world. So in the deductive branch, that branch around mathematics, and formal logic, the way that this um, hunt to root out error has manifest itself is in the notion of the proof, right? You wouldn't publish a mathematical finding without telling the community how you got there through that formal notion of the proof. Uh, similarly, in the empirical branch, they have an analogous notion where we have an entire machinery of hypothesis testing, a way that you would set up this problem you apply appropriate statistical methods, and then you have a very structured way that you communicate those results through that method section. So I challenge anyone here to publish uh, results and just leave the method section blank. It just won't be published. Right? It's very, very important for that transparency and that communication of how you actually got to that results, those results. So what I think we need is the development of comparable standards, standards similar to what we have for the first and second branch of the scientific method, but for the computational research, the third branch, fourth branch of the scientific method. So what's our idea of the proof? What do we need to communicate so that other people in the community feel satisfied that we rooted out the error the best that we could? So there are notions um, around this. So many people doing research are, are, have been bugged by this and have thought about it. I'm certainly not the only one who's interested in this issue. And uh, there's a notion of really reproducible research that was developed in 1992, or sort of promulgated in 1992, by now emeritus uh, Stanford professor John Clairbout. And David Donahoe, who, who did the quote in the middle, was my thesis advisor. And he was paraphrasing Clairbout as follows. So he says, the idea of really reproducible research is that an article in, about computational science in a scientific publication is not the scholarship itself. So that PDF is not characterized as the scholarship. It's merely advertising of the scholarship. The actual scholarship is the complete set of instructions and data which generated the figures and tables and the results in the paper. And as I've mentioned, I, I think I've touched on this already, this difference in sort of running through the same code on the same data and regenerating the results versus an independent implementation. And so what, what Donahoe and Clairbaut are saying here is we need to be able to get the, the software steps, the data that were used that underlie that, that scientific result that's being given to the community through the scholarly record, and we need to be able to deliver those along with that, that result. Okay, so there, there are all of these changes happening in the research um, context, and as we know, research is governed by 
these um, norms. And so thinking about what norms could actually guide our responses or how we actually instantiate that delivery of these digital objects as part of the scholarly record. Um, so there's many different ways you could lean on different norms. I just, I looked at Merton's scientific norms from 1942, and I'm presenting them somewhat uncritically here, and I should mention that there is quite a bit of criticism of these norms and development and so on, but, um, but the germ of these norms, I think, is correct and also useful for these um, discussions that we're having today. So Merton postulated five norms, communalism, which I think he actually called communism, but it's since evolved into communalism. <laughs> Um, scientific results are the common property of the community. I might even push on that and say they're the common property of the public. Univers uh, universalism, all scientists can contribute to science regardless of race, nationality, culture, or gender. Disinterestedness, as researchers were acting for the benefit of the scientific enterprise rather than for our own personal gain. Originality, so making a contribution to the community, a research contribution, must be original or adding something new to the discussion. And skepticism, scientific claims must be exposed to critical scrutiny before being accepted. So the two that I focus on the most in my research or I found most useful is the idea of communalism, being able to share the results in such a way that they're broadly available, and skepticism, um, exposing these claims to critical scrutiny. Okay, so skepticism, I can, you can trace this lineage back to the 1660s. This is a picture of um, Robert Boyle, as many of you, I'm sure, recognized. So skepticism, requiring that the claim can be independently verified. So not con you don't have to email the author, for example, to try and understand what they actually did um, in their publication. So what this means is we need to have a notion of transparency in the communication of the research process, so what went into generating those results. And uh, like I said, it, that's from the 1660s. Okay, so what does all this mean um, about the scholarly record? So I have, a, I have a couple of ideas if we're thinking about what the scholarly record might mean in this computational context. So we need to um, use the scholarly record to be able to access or regenerate um, scientific research findings. So I need to be able to get a hold of items that were relied on in the generation of those published results. Um, I need to be able to have whatever information is material for an independent replication or for reproducibility. So one of the things that, the reason I have two there, um, two options is because every publication around a scientific discovery is in some sense a stylized narrative. You never have um, a sort of a diary of everything that was tried and everything that went wrong and all the dead ends the researcher went to. If you read these, um, these articles, it's always this smooth progression, you know, right to the results. And in a sense, that's, that's right. I mean, we don't need to be bothered by the mistakes and the typos and things like that. On the other hand, we do miss this sort of intellectual growth that the researchers went through. And more importantly to statistical reproducibility, um, these avenues that didn't work out can actually be extremely material for understanding the, um, uh, the significance of the ones that did work out. So in a sense, we've got some thinking to do about, well, what parts of the story are relevant for inclusion when I'm actually telling others about the results that I've found? Okay, so what, what do I mean by these items that we'd want to share? We can think about articles or manuscripts, text, code, software, data, workflow information. So how did I actually implement those scripts and the software on the data, what were my parameter settings, what order were the scripts applied in? So how do I actually use all those pieces to knit them together to get those results that are in the publication? Research environment details, what did my computational um, setting look like when I did those, that, that inference on, on the data? And then other items, Again, you'll recognize this as to be part of the discussion around empirical reproducibility that I'm not emphasizing so much in this talk are material objects like the reagents, lab equipment, instruments, text, historical artifacts, and so on. So just as important for reproducibility, just not the type of reproducibility I'm emphasizing today. So we're sharing items, we're sharing items that can change. Data sets can be corrected, 
updated, um, renormalized. Software is extremely dynamic and fluid when people are actively using it, changing very frequently. So it brings in this notion of versioning as absolutely crucial to everything we're doing and we're sharing these types of information. Okay, so as I mentioned, I'm not the only one who's noticed these problems. Um, a number of researchers have noticed as well. So I put together this slide of some of the tools that people have built uh, to try and help with this problem. So one thing that you may think is, well, you know, this is a, a computation, if you're talking about computational reproducibility, this is research that's happening in silica, for example, so why don't we build some computational tools that would do things like capture that version of the data set or what software you actually used and bundle it all up and maybe make it more shareable in a more automated way. And I think that's a very natural response and I think that's um, an incredibly important part of the solution. And so people have been doing this type of thing. And I'll just note that for most of the um, research tools that I'm pointing out on this slide, and it's a hopelessly incomplete list, so I don't, it's almost a haphazard list. So I apologize in advance to anyone that I forgot. Um, but, the, but what's going on that's notable with these tools is most of them, these are just faculty members who have developed tools and instruments to help with the research and help with reproducibility on the side of their day job because they think it's just an incredibly important thing and a gap that's missing. And um, one thing I've noticed as this discussion progresses, and um, I'm starting to see this more and more, is now commercial interests are starting to come in more and more and provide these support tools. So that's just part of the discussion in a dimension that is worth considering. So I roughly group these tools into three categories dissemination platforms. So I work on Research Compendia, the first one there, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, IPOL, Image Processing Online, Machine Learning, Open Source um, Software. So this is, these, are, these are sort of post-publication. I want to deliver you some digital object that I think should be running with my publication. And so these are, these are some solutions that are, that are trying to fill that gap and, and finding ways to get, say, data sets to you, software to you, workflow information to you as the reader and consumer of the, of the publication. Pre-publication, there are a number of tools also that are being created. So as I mentioned, helping capture what might be important for sharing um, before you actually get to that point of publication. So these are the workflow tracking and research environments and many um, tools with a lot of deep work behind them to help capture those environments, um, what variables were actually used, what your inputs were to the software and deliver that as part of the publication as well if the author chooses. Uh, the final category, and these are all kind of a little bit overlapping, uh, the final category, embedded publishing. So we still, our currency in the scholarly record is still the static PDF. Can we do something a little more um, congruent to the types of uh, research that we're actually doing in the computational sphere? So for example, could I deliver you a PDF where you can click into images and grab the code or click in and find the data or maybe even have it regenerate within the PDF, for example. So I've been calling those embedded publishing and there's a number of efforts around there as well. So um, I think the fact that we're seeing these tools sort of popping up and organically arising, many from a grassroots level, um, really speaks to the importance of the problem, where the researchers are stepping in and trying to build this, um, these infrastructure responses on their own to try and just do better research. What I started the talk um, sort of loosely calling you know, research with integrity. Okay, so I'll mention also Research Compendia a little bit, the one that I've been working on. So the notion, the, sort of the fundamental idea of Research Compendia is um, the scholarly record is proceeding, more and more publications being added to it kind of every second. And many of those publications um, have data that underlie the results, have code that underlie the results. I'd actually even make an argument that the majority at this point do. And so the question is then, is there a way to persistently house 
um, data, software, workflow information, those computational artifacts that tra should be traveling, in my opinion, with the um, publication in such a way that they're persistently available to the reader of that original publication. So the idea of Research Compendia was really as a pilot project so we could start to understand, well, what do researchers need? How difficult is this type of sharing? What problems and barriers do we start to run into? So we're trying to link the data and code to these published claims enable reuse, and develop um, a better understanding or guide for people who are doing this research and being able to promulgate these, these additional aspects. Uh, we also realized that once you have the code and the data, we could actually just run it ourselves and certify results, even though we're not actually maybe the intended recipient. The, the, lots of um, the work that we've supported on research compendia is published in fields where I don't have expertise, for example, but we can still get the code running. We can still use their data. And so we're able to sort of say, well, we were able to get those same figures, same tables as in your paper. And so we could do that baseline kind of verification of at least the computational soundness of the results, not saying that they're correct, but at least saying I could run this, the, the, the digital objects that you gave me and I could get the results. <clears throat> okay, it also opens up other um, um, of their opportunities. So in a particular area around a research question, if people are sharing their data and their software with, associated with their publications, we could start putting the data together and running the software that we have on a much larger data set and validating those results in a much more powerful way. And do things like stability checks or sensitivity checks in the methods and in the data itself. So things that aren't the traditional way that we would think about the reason or the purpose of sharing scholarly information. Okay, so here's an example of those pages I was talking about. So I just grabbed a page on Research Compendia. The blue title at the top will link back to the published article. So this isn't, unless it's an open, open access journal, we're not taking local copies of the publication and making them available for obvious reasons with copyright, but at least we can link back um, to the article. In this one, this happens to be an open access um, article, so you can see in those buttons about two thirds of the way down, you can click and grab the article directly from the Compendia page. And you can grab code and you can grab data. And so the idea here is the abstract describes code and data, the digital objects that are traveling with the publication. Um, the authors uh, might be programmers or data curators, for example, people who have contributed deeply to the success of the paper, yet may not be listed in the traditional authorship role on the publication. There's a lot of kind of norms and standards about um, how those authors are decided on. And then we have additional information around um, how the intellectual property is licensed here, which I'll get to in a moment. Okay, it's all open source, so we have Research Compendia sitting there on GitHub. We do, by the way, assign um, DOIs to code, data, to the Research Compendia page, and then we have a DOI for Research Compendia as well. And the idea is assigning these DOIs in such a way that they're linked, hopefully, with the publication. Um, that involves more of an engagement and um, discussion with publishers to do this before publication. But at the minimum, we'll have them um, hierarchically linked within themselves so that they're discoverable as a bundle. Um, and then we applied the MIT license, very open permissive license to our um, platform, the software that's on um, GitHub and available. So all of you can just grab a copy, stand up, Research Compendia, your version yourself, and work with it or extend it. Okay, so um, I'd like to finish with uh, a few comments on intellectual property. So one of the things that um, uh, happens in the interaction between software and intellectual property is that um, software falls under copyright by default. So copyright, as you probably know, extends to um, any original expression of an underlying idea. So the underlying idea is never barred with intellectual property. However, as soon as you have this in fixed form, um, then this is then, the fixed form itself is then copyright to the, the original author. So there's a nice phrase that copyright follows the author's pen across the page. You don't have to register copyright, this is a default. And so we're very used to thinking about copyright in the context of text, 
but it also is equally as applicable in the context of software, where we have an idea for what we might like the machine to do, and then we go ahead and we code it in some language. And that, again, is putting in fixed form some original expression of an underlying idea, so copyright applies. So um, Stallman was one of the first people to notice that this created a big problem for sharing of uh, software. So for example, if you're the copyright holder, I have to ask you if I want to make a copy or reproduce your work. So that's very burdensome. So I can't just go, out, go and download software from the web that's sitting out there unless I ask you if it's okay if I go ahead and use it or maybe change it a bit or apply it in a new um, setting. Um, and that lasts, of course, as we know, 70 years plus the life of the author and probably something to do with the longevity <clears throat> of Mickey Mouse as well. So the 70 years <laughs> keeps kind of extending and extending and extending. So I consider um, copyright essentially to be in perpetuity. And certainly for software and for these computational objects, 70 years is essentially infinite anyway. So what Stallman did, his big innovation was, well, instead of having people email me or contact me to ask my permission to use my software that I've put on the web, why don't I just attach a little bit of text that says, you've got my permission already, and here's the permission that I'm giving you. You can use it under these circumstances. So that was the advent of open source licensing. And Stallman's background was to try and foment and create an open source software community, and often his insight around licensing is credited with the successful creation of the open source software entire movement and community. Um, however, the norms of the open source software community, they don't map to the norms of the research community perfectly. So there are gaps. And one of the things that I thought about was, well, what would be appropriate leaning on already the enormous amount of work that's happened in um, open licensing for making these digital objects that travel with research available? So we go back to things like communalism. Let's make things as broadly available as we can. Uh, research operates by citation. That's how we get our credit. So there are many licenses that will do exactly that, that will make um, software, for example, or copyrighted objects available to do whatever you'd like with as long as you attribute the original author. So one of them is the MIT license that we saw on um, Research Compendia, for example. So my recommendation is take these software objects that are associated with research and make them available with an attribution only license or make them available in the public domain. These are the, li th these are the ways of structuring intellectual property that most closely match the norms that we already have in the research community. Your media components, so the article, figures, tables, making this available under attribution only license for text, not a software license, like for example, the Creative Commons attribution license, that would match our longstanding norms. Now I just sort of swept aside the whole issue with publishers and copyright, but we're just talking in, in, in ideals right now. Um, the final object, um, data. Data is uh, trickier to license because there is no copyright on raw facts in the US. However, and, and of course the licenses adhere to copyright, um, however, the um, notion of what a raw fact actually is in research, I bet every single person here would have a different answer for me. And the courts, and there, the, nobody's really answered that question. So I think arguably, um, if you have done some original selection and arrangement of the raw data in the, court, in the Supreme Court's words, um, there may be copyright that adheres to at least that original selection and arrangement of the data, although not the raw facts. So perhaps, an open license could travel with data, for example. Or if you want to just forget that whole conversation, putting data out in the, in the public domain is another way to make it broadly available. So the idea is um, of the reproducible research standard is take away that barrier that's introduced by copyright to the promulgation of Claire Bout's notion of really reproducible research, where I can take computational findings and I can get the code, I can get the original data, I could rerun this, presumably, and uh, verify those results, extend those results, take the code, put it on my new data, or take the data, mix it with something that I'm doing, and extend the research. And what would, I think, to everyone in this room seem like a very natural thing to do. So taking that IP framework and um, making it 
aligned with these longstanding norms that I discussed earlier. Okay, so I wanted to just finish with a couple of slides with open questions and queries to um, sort of oh, sort of really make us think as imaginatively as we can about what this scholarly record could look like. So queries that I would like to make on scholarly computational publications. I'd like to be able to ask the scholarly record to show me a table of effect sizes, p-values, so statistical output on all phase three clinical trials for melanoma published after 1994. That's a very hard query today. I would like to query the scholarly record and ask for all the image denoising algorithms that have been applied to remove white noise from the famous Barbara image. The Barbara image is used all over signal processing and image processing. So tell me what all those publications were and actually give me the citations too of where those, um, public, where, where those algorithms were used and introduced. Give me all the classification algorithms that were used um, on the famous acute lymphoblastic leukemia data set. This is one also that's very common in a certain strain of literature, along with type 1, type 2 error rates, so some statistical output as well. The output would all be in those papers, so we're not really co computing anything. I just want to deliver what's been published. Uh, give me a unified data set containing all the published whole genome sequences identified with the mutation in the gene BRCA1. Um, that's also a very hard query uh, to do. I would like to randomly reassign treatment and control labels to cases around a particular clinical trial, published cases, and then I could calculate effect size. Then what I could do is say, repeat this multiple times and do it for every clinical trial published in the year 2003, listing trial name and this particular histogram, giving these um, reevaluated results side by side so we could get a sense of the effectiveness of these clinical trials in the, in the published scholarly record. These are hard today, but I would like to move to uh, a reality where we can routinely make these kinds of queries. Okay. So cyber infrastructure, thinking about tools, I think successful tools need to minimize the amount of time the researcher is going to take in learning the tool and using the tool. I don't think a successful tool is something that's going to take a huge amount of researcher time and effort and energy. We need to think about um, automating as much of the discovery and dissemination process as possible. Not automating the intellectual aspects, but automating things like what version of that data set was used to produce figure four. For example, that's something the machine knows and we can just capture from the machine with the appropriate tools. What particular frozen form of the software was actually used? Can I grab that? So it doesn't stop us from doing things like fixing bugs in software. All software is buggy. It doesn't stop us from doing things like fixing mistakes and updating data sets, for example, but we still need those versions that produced those results in the scholarly record, mistakes and all, warts and all. As I mentioned, facilitating queries across the scholarly record that go to those computational aspects, data, software, algorithms, for example, and then capturing all that information needed in the research process to allow people in the field to verify and assess those findings. It's all really about delivering evidence for those results. Okay. There have been a couple of community responses that I'll just touch on. Um, in Yale, uh, Yale Law School, we did a round table in 2009 with different stakeholders and um, we called it, we had a published work workshop report called um, Addressing the Need for Data and Code Sharing in Computational Science. At Brown University, we had a similar round table um, for the week-long ICERM series in 2012. So there we titled our workshop report Setting the Default to Reproducible in Computational Science and Research. So getting the code out there, getting the data out there, getting these artifacts out there and accompanying their results. Um, in 2014, in the summer, um, with the Exceed project, which is a project that is meant to facilitate access to high-performance computing technologies and machines and systems for users that may not typically work there, so acting as middleware software, they sort of thought, well, maybe that's somewhere where we could really be enabling some of the cyber, infra cyber infrastructure aspects of reproducibility since we've already got software wrapped around their processes as middleware, maybe we can go ahead and capture some of those things like code, data, versions, and so on, machine state, for example. 
I won't spend time, but of course we're being pushed, as everybody knows, from um, the White House with their mandates around access to publications and access to data. Now notice that access to code, access to workflows wasn't mentioned. I think that's up to us as the community to wrap those into our discussion and have a more holistic way of presenting the results where really it's about evidence and it's about reproducibility. Um, the federal agencies are moving beyond what OSTP is requiring them to do. So last year, National Science Foundation in September had a um, workshop they called Reliable Science, the path to robust research results. So that's going beyond just dissemination of data, for example. And NSF actually has a rigor and reproducibility page, I'm sorry, NIH has a rigor and reproducibility page talking about their efforts to make data available, software available, and so on. Um, and then journal requirements, uh, journals, another stakeholder also kicking in. So um, I did a, a, a study a few years ago on, well, what are journals saying about code requirements and publication, data requirements and publication? And um, they are not um, to the point where this is solving the problem. However, they are taking nibbles at the problem and making data available and making code available. Okay, so two different ways to think about this. So on the production side, um, we have things like crowdsourcing, public engagement in science. We're putting um, data online, software online with our published results. This is really different from a societal perspective than one researcher writing a letter to another researcher asking to mail the preprints. Right? This is something now people are looking at this from all walks of life and all backgrounds. It's not an internal dialogue anymore. So, this pipeline, so opening up this accent to these coherent digital scholarly objects, coherent is in quotes because I'm trying to communicate how it should be attached to a published narrative, how there should be usability to enable reuse, having licensing that enables reuse, for example, mechanisms for evaluating new findings. So what happens when people start playing with our work in the scholarly community and then they come up with really interesting new, new, new insights and in research? Do we have a way of folding that into the larger discussion or are we just expecting them to submit their publication to the journal like all of us do? Um, and then, like I mentioned, the legal issues around reuse and privacy. On the other side around crowd, uh, uh, sort of in opposition to crowdsourcing and this public engagement is the use of the output of our research more broadly than ever. So these findings and publications coming from what I've been calling third branch, fourth branch, the computational research are feeding into all sorts of policy making. Everybody has heard evidence-based whatever, right? Evidence-based healthcare, evidence-based policy, evidence-based medicine. So this is, this is something that's now becoming part of the currency of our policy dialogue itself. So how do we know that those findings are really right unless we can go in and look at the code, look at the data, rerun things, and do those um, verification checks that have always been part of science that need to require more thought and more effort to um, extend these to the computational aspects. Okay, so for um, cyber infrastructure dreams and wishes, data access, software access, persistent linking to publications that I've mentioned. Um, I'm including in there also the workflow um, uh, parts of the conversation. Linked DOI assignment on articles, data, code, workflows, making this entire compendia that we're publishing rather than this static PDF. Uh, I've, I've talked about data access. I haven't talked about any of the barriers to data and code access. So, for example, can we be more innovative when we have, say, um, legal barriers to the sharing of data or ethical barriers? So, for example, you have human subjects in your data and we're not just going to be able to make those data available. If you do education research, we're not able to make student data publicly available, but can we be more innovative about how we might provide access rather than thinking of it as a binary that's sort of closed or open? I think yes. Um, are we using robust methods, producing stable results and findings from these data? Do we have our emphasis correctly on reliability and reproducibility from the findings that we're actually garnering from the, from the data? And I think the cyber infrastructure should be open source and should be inspectable, reusable, and so on. Okay, and I'll, I'll just make a quick note of the Google Flu Trends um, uh, um, argument or sort of experience, where if you remember, um, Google decided to start uh, making 
its um, trend data available, or not, well, sort of started making announcements and predictions about how it was using its trend data, they were actually better at predicting flu trends in the US than the CDC, for example. And they got a lot of um, you know, press and attention on this because it looked like people's search terms in Google were actually providing a better picture of what's happening in our society than sort of doctor reporting and hospital reporting to CDC that we'd long relied on. So people were very excited about this. Um, if you had, you know, if, if, if our conversation today was of interest to you then, you might have had questions like, yeah, but how do we know Google's getting that right? And what are their prediction methods? What are their models? What's the underlying data? All of that was opaque. And then in um, 2013, 2014, Google flu trends suddenly stopped working. The predictions weren't as good. To this day, I don't think anybody except the people, the, the sort of small group within Google knows why. So the question then becomes, when can we rely on this output and this information, and when can we not? And shouldn't we have better mechanisms rather than just trust me? So here are principles for um, cyber infrastructure supporting the scientific norms. I've, I've put a few out there today. Um, as I said, I didn't put them out in a definitive way, but there are these long-standing norms that we do need to support in terms of research that characterizes the research itself. Supporting best practices in science. So this is, I think, a more open discussion. So what should the best practices look like in the computational arena? Um, taking a holistic approach to cyber infrastructure. So we think about many of the descriptions of um, examples that I've used in the talk today would easily fall in the paradigm of data science. So what does it mean to do data science? Well, does it mean understanding what your data generation mechanism was, where you got the data, what are metadata associated with the data, what have you done to prepare that data for analysis, what analysis have you done, as I mentioned, those are all encoded in software, almost never shared, and then how, why should I believe this? What are you doing to convince me that the, say, the machine learning algorithms or whatever it is that you, analysis you've applied to the data is really right? Can I even take a look at this? Did you tweak those parameters for, and just get really good results? and then publish those? Or is this something that's more broadly stable and applicable? Right now, it's difficult to understand that for many of the published results. So having this end, understanding this end-to-end -end research pipeline right through to reuse, sharing, and how it's handed off into the next project. Okay, I just mentioned as a teaser there the social and political environment, um, because of course all of these discussions um, who pays for cyber infrastructure, for example, they start to involve government entities and funders, and we're always, always these discussions are embedded in a larger political context and a social context that we need to be aware of. And so I'll finish with some open questions. Who funds and supports, say, for example, tool development, cyber infrastructure? Who owns data, code, research outputs? So I have been loosely talking about it throughout the talk as if the researcher generated it and is making it available. Oftentimes, the researchers using data that were generated somewhere else by other groups. Um, or do they want to put this in a trusted repository that their community uses? So we have a generator. We have a user who's created results. We have a repository who's adding value through metadata, persistence, discoverability. What about the funder who funded the project? Wouldn't the university say, well, I also supported that. Those are my data. So we have all these sort of tugs around who owns data. We haven't even gotten to the conversation about who owns code, and it's something similar. Um, so these research outputs, I think that's a conversation that's coming. Who's controlling access? Who's controlling the gateways? Having a sort of um, discussion before it's a calamity, I think, is, is important. What are the community standards around documentation, citation? standards, best practices, who's going to enforce this? Should it be different for different research groups? Do we have um, sort of larger principles that we can communicate to the scientific community and then act on and embed in the cyber infrastructure we're developing? Um, how do you cite the cyber infrastructure itself? How do you reward this? This goes back to number one, who's going to fund and support it? How do you know what's working and what's not working? What are the incentives to do this development of cyber infrastructure and how should we be thinking about a healthy system that actually encourages this type of behavior? Um, I'll stop here, and I think we have um, well, maybe not enough time for questions, but maybe a minute or two. So I'll just open the floor to, to questions. And, and of course, like, like as I said, I'll be around um, through the whole workshop if you have other questions. So thank you. Yeah. 
Hi, I was interested in your work on uh, research compendium yeah. and that, whether that sounded like something that could be automated uh, as a confirmation in the future. And secondly, if there are any success stories hidden in failures where something didn't yeah. pass. Those are, those are great questions. So one of the things that we've been working on that I didn't show you here is um, sort of having small virtual machines around the computational deliverables, so around the code and around the data. So you, we, we're not doing this, but you could imagine having this sort of minimal virtual machine that a researcher might even work in and then just deliver that as part of their publication. And they, you would know that things sort of worked and you'd have that confirmation in advance from the researcher. And we're not at that stage yet, but I can certainly see that and that level of automation. And, I, and it's a great question. I'd really like to see research compendia even more automated than it actually is. We just sort of layer, we're layering right now on top of the existing system, you know, so um, it's clunky in a way. And we can certainly be smoother in the future. So that's a great question. Yeah. Uh, Dave Rosenthal from Stanford. Uh, two quick points on that. Um, firstly, availability of the source does not um, guarantee reproducible of course. Uh, execution. Yeah. We have the example of uh, the emulation of the Chase software that um, was done by the Olive team at CMU, where uh, this, uh, the code was deposited with the paper, but it requires a specific version of Ubuntu and a specific set of libraries in order to run it. Yeah. Uh, and the other is, well, people are starting to deliver um, virtual ma machines. We noticed that the feed that we get from ACM for the clocks archive last fall suddenly became bigger than the feed we get from Elsevier, which was quite a surprise. And the reason was twofold. One of them was it started being filled up with videos of people giving pr presentations, which take a lot of space. The other was it started being filled up with VMs. Yeah. And most of these are virtu uh, VMware virtual machines. Which are uh, huge. Right. Which are huge, which um, there is no guarantee that we can run those in the future, and which contain all sorts of potentially licensed software that we have no idea what it is. Yep. And so we were forced to consult our agreement with ACM and point out that they were indemnifying us against copyright uh, violations by the stuff that they were delivering us, and we were going to depend on it. Yeah, yeah, no, th those are excellent points. Um, I could have spent the whole talk just talking about software sharing and all the sort of pitfalls and issues. Um, so one of the one of the one of the points that you're raising that's extremely important is just having the source code doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? Um, maybe you can ex inspect it, but it's hundreds of thousands of lines long. How do you even open source something that big? It'll take you years to even read it. So so the way that I've been thinking about solutions around that is again actually leaning on the um, traditional of the open source software community where they would deliver software um, with tests. And we do not do that at all in our research in this community, um, in, this, in the research community. And we have no notion of sort of software testing. So if I wanted to sort of understand how a piece of software worked and maybe whether or not I should trust it, I would immediately start leaning on tests. And that's a, that's a conversation that's just starting. So certainly software is neither necessary nor sufficient for reproducibility. However, I think in the majority of cases, it's extraordinarily helpful. And of course, the ideal would be running the software. And I just sort of skimmed over that like how we would just run it all, and that's non-trivial as well in terms of what needs to be delivered to actually run the software. And as one person said at one of our workshops, you can't virtualize blue waters. So sometimes you're on these very specialized pieces of hardware, and what does reproducibility mean in that context? So there are fascinating edge cases, I think, around these issues. However, I think what I'm talking about probably applies to upwards of 80 or 90 percent of the research that's being done, where you have relatively short scripts on um, static databases, and we could do a better job sharing that as a default openly, and then start to think about, well, maybe I can use sort of very lightweight virtual machines or start to innovate around this. I don't think these problems are insoluble. I think there will always be very challenging cases, though. Yes. Oftentimes in the uh, in web development, um, things that are just good enough tend to, to, to take, it, take off and take advantage over more worked out uh, scholarly and, yeah. and formally designed systems. 
um, Jupiter Hub stands strikes me as one of the ex example of that because it seems to embody a lot yep. of the elements. So I'm just curious about your reaction to that as a submission mechanism for journals and things of that sort. Yeah, no, this is this is taking off, and I think this may become the next standard. So I do. Oh, my slides aren't on there, um, but it's fine. So that that slide that I had with the infrastructure responses, um, one of the ones that I point to is Jupiter on there, and um, this is being used everywhere. People, um, if you remember, we had the breakthrough on the detection of gravitational waves. Well, the computational aspects are reproducible and they're shared in a Jupyter notebook, for example. And so that's something where um, we sort of start the conversation in the right way and then we can sort of fail fast, right? And it's, I think we certainly are going to do things, like Research Companion is an example where I'm building on an existing system, it's certainly not beautiful or sort of highly developed software or whatnot, but we're trying different things out and we're prepared to make mistakes and sort of have an agile response. And my understanding from Jupiter too is that that's similar. So we can actually be extensible. I mean, um, Fernando Perez evolved it from um, Python out to say R, Julia, and other um, uh, pieces of software that are being used all over science as well. So it's certainly the case that we're not going to hit perfect the first time, and I'm fine with not having the beautifully engineered solution, as you mentioned, and just taking um, what we can get and start building on it. We just need to be sensitive to the brittleness of software, which is once standards are evolved and in place, particularly with software, it, it is difficult to change course. So just sort of thinking about what, what would it mean to maximize that ability to be agile, and that's part of the reason that underlies my push for open source in the platforms, not just in the, in the research as well. Okay, it looks like we are out of questions and out of time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. That, um, that was a really illuminating talk, um, and there's a lot to think about. I suspect you're going to be having a lot of hall conversations in the next uh, 24 hours or so. Thank you Thank again. You.